Hey, James, congratulations on this film summary. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Hey, you know what? I appreciate it. I love these type of, uh, I want to say like these imaginative uh, coming of age stories. And that's, once again, you did a terrific job on, on this film. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> but uh, more of a congratulations that this is being showcased at this, this year's Sundance uh, Film Festival. How do you feel about that? You know, it, it's thrilling to me. I mean, I, um, you know, I, I, where I grew, I grew up in Georgia, and um, like as a as a as a teenage like film nerd, <laughs> um, just trying to like get everything from Blockbuster and the local video store and from the library. I would, um, you know, would would read film magazines about about what was playing at Sundance, you know, and and those sort of seminal Sundance movies like, you know, that I would read about like Sex, Lies and Videotape or Clerks or whatever it was, I would seek out. And Sundance, which was sort of this abstract conceptual place to me, um, you know, represented in a curatorial sense, like a place where there were, you know, specific voices, um, voices that weren't being represented by mainstream sort of Hollywood movies. And it was something that always, um, seemed exciting to me. And then when I got older, when I got to film school and started <clears throat> getting, I guess, more ambitious with films, I, you know, I hoped like a lot of people to have a film that would play at Sundance, you know, and I've been lucky to have some, you know, different films play there. And I always feel grateful and I feel like it's part of a, I mean, I, I love, I go to Sundance also sometimes when I don't have a film. I just love watching movies. I love the buzz of seeing things for the first time. Um, it's thrilling, it's humbling, and um, yeah, so I'm grateful. Well, most certainly that this this film is going to generate that buzz. But as uh, as always, like we all, us uh, interviewers like to ask is, what sparked you to uh, write the story for Summering? Yeah, um, you know, Summering, I, I, yeah, I co-wrote it um, with a friend, Ben Percy, and I think a lot of it began, both of us, we have, we, we both grew up in small towns, um, but we had similar dynamics. Like we have um, uh, strong mothers, strong sisters who are really influential on us. We both have daughters. Um, you know, I have several kids as is Ben. His daughter is exactly the age of these characters. Mine is a little bit younger. Um, I think a lot of it came from conversations that we were having with our kids and especially our daughters about the lack of, of representation of young women and specifically stories about young female friendship that involves adventure and first brushes with death or mortality, all of those sort of things that we think of as maybe staples of a certain type of storytelling in fiction and in films, um, certainly from my childhood in the 80s and 90s, um, you know, usually we're through experience through the lens of, of, of boys. And, um, and, and female characters, there was a dearth of them and they would include, you know, the sister or the girl down the block, things like that. And I, I think, um, you know, there was a real desire to, to, to dramatize and dignify the emotional inner lives of, of young female characters and have a female centered story. And, and to, um, especially over the past couple of years, um, I think this is the case for everybody, but especially for parents, you know, more and more, I think, we, we found ourselves having conversations with our kids where they're asking, you know, things like, are we going to be okay? Is it safe to go outside? Will you come home today? All of these, the abstract terror of childhood, which can feel like a horror movie at times, especially as you get into middle school, have felt much more palpable and real. And so I think thematically that worked its way into the film. So how, how you and your co-writer want to construct uh, these, uh, these young, uh, young girl, young female characters? I, because I am always fascinated about uh, how, you know, how you want to create these uh, type of personalities. But, the, but then it's always when, when you think of a group, somehow you always think of a group of four. That, that's how, yeah. that's like a magic number we always come up with. Yeah, I mean, I think there were initially the first, I think like in early drafts, there were five and then five became four. But yeah, I mean, it was all of these characters, the 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 um, young, you know, the, the girls, as well as their mothers, you know, because so much of the story is a generational story with parents, you know, looking at their kids, both wanting to keep them safe, but wanting them to be fearless and realizing that they're projecting their own fears and anxieties on their kids um, you know, with, with each of these characters, they're all in some ways inspired by people that, that we know that are, that are good friends. And, 
you know, I mean, in, in, in my case, I mean, my, my wife works out of middle school, high school, um, and, and I, you know, and, and every year sort of meeting a new group of kids who are, you know, it, it's a very specific time in, in, in our lives that sort of 12, you know, 11, 12 years old as we're going into middle school, when if you take a friend group of, say, four kids, a lot of them, and I'm totally generalizing now, but they, the emotional development can be, in, they can be in wildly different places. Some, some kids at that age really still, you know, they use their imaginations, their childlike imagination to process trauma. And for some kids in that group, the fear of losing their best friends might be more real than their fear of death, because maybe they've lived, you know, they've been lucky enough to not have to encounter death firsthand with friends or family yet, but that might not be the case for all of them. Um, but very quickly, you know, at age 13, 14, suddenly you are in early adolescence and on a sprint towards adulthood. And, you know, you're putting away those those childish things, as it were. And, and you know, there's just a, a shift in, in, in consciousness, I think. Well, then let, let's address, uh, you know, one of the themes uh, before before I repro approach the issue of death. Let's approach the issue of childhood uh, imaginations, because it seems like you love, um, you know, inputting childhood imaginations. You, you love... Uh, Personally, you love, sounds like you love children's stories or telling them. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the thing that's exciting to me is when I think of, um, you know, a lot of my favorite films in the same way that I don't, um, like, I, I tend to just say, like, younger actor as, as opposed to child actor, because I think child actor can imply something, you know, that, like, less than, and um, as though they're not fully capable of the wide range of human emotion that a 45-year-old actor could be. Um, and I, and I, I think, you know, when I think of, you know, a lot of my favorite films about young people, many of them, they're inter international films, you know, I'm thinking of like Ozu films, you know, from Japan, where there would be generational stories, you know, where it would be children, parents, grandparents, all in the same home, or I'm thinking of the Antoine Donnell films from Truffaut, or, or the Apu films from India, any, any of these films that, um, you know, that, that aren't really, they're not kid films or children's films, they just, the protagonists happen to be younger, in the same way that some films, characters happen to be 80 years old, but I, I think, I think, you know, complicated portray, you know, portrayals of the complexities of what it is to be alive through the lens of a younger person or an older person, those groups tend to get marginalized. We tend to focus on people at a very specific age, you know, in middle age, perhaps. Um, and, and I think, you know, all of us in our own different ways, when we're kids, we have ways of coping with loss and fear and trauma, and we find surrogates. We all, you know, whether whether it's, you know, um, I, I don't know, whether it's playing with army figurines or whether it's playing with dolls, whether it's burying things in the yard, what, what it is, you know, everyone has an experience where they first find a dead animal, a dead squirrel, a dead bird, whatever it is, the way a four-year-old would engage with that is different than the way an eight-year-old, which is different than a 12-year-old, which is different than the way I would. And um, I think all of them are worthy. You know, every every version of it is worthy of being dramatized. Um, you know, we specifically were focusing on like this age that in theory, again, generalizing, but is maybe the last dying gasp of a moment in someone's life, you know, that sort of 12 years old, um, when you still maybe... You still are holding on to kid things, but again, within a year or two, that's all out the window, and you're just on a sprint to adulthood. That is, that is most that is most excellent answer. And 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 the thing is, uh, when I was watching the films, I I noted a, a few of the references, uh, probably possibly to maybe some some favorite book, children's books like Tuck Everlasting or Bridge of Terror, Bithia. I mean that I think you put all that on purpose just to. Uh, expand our minds towards childhood imaginations yeah i mean i think you know um when you think of books like exactly like took everlasting or bridge to terabithia which is an amazing book that's been a historically a banned book and i think a lot of a lot of the books that get banned in the united states for young people tend to be the exact books they should be reading <laughs> because they tend to deal with issues related to equity or social justice or depression or economic inequality or whatever or they're just or death, whatever it is, there are things that uh, many, I think it's a lot of our favorite books. And I think a lot of my favorite portrayals of, of death around that age, whether it's 
the spirit of the beehive which is a great spanish film from the 70s or stand by me i think they they all um the they know that emotions fears anxieties whatever it is are mentionable and manageable um you know for 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 kids like the, the exact same thing i mean it's something it was probably a big an assumption but something of a lived in blind spot for me until i had kids of my own that I just realized, oh, kids are experiencing everything we're experiencing. You can think you're protecting them from stuff, but it all everything seeps into the groundwater of a kid's consciousness. They might talk about it in a different way. They might process it. They might represent it in a different way, but they're grappling with the same stuff that we are. And so, especially over the past two years, almost now, as the world has felt like it's flipped upside down, everything that we're dealing with, kids are having to process. You know, they really are. And I think the real cultural societal fallout of like what the past two years have been as it relates to mental health like a collective ptsd whatever whatever it is whatever language we want to use i think how it's affected kids i think it's going to take a long time for us to understand exactly how that is but whatever you or i are experiencing kids definitely are as well they might just not have the tools that we have or they might have different tools to process similar experiences so when you when you see a film like a uh... When you made a film like Summering, did did you did you process it as like a, it's a story about how they perceive an imagined death, or did you process it as like a story of friendship? Both. Um, I, I you know I I, I I mean I definitely um, you know it's a great question. Um, I mean hope I mean I definitely approached it as both. I mean I, I saw it as you know it's a platonic love story between four friends. Um, you know and um, I think traditionally a lot of narratives around young female characters the relationships are defined by their personal trauma or about a rupturing in the friendship when a boy enters the story you know and and it was very clear th these are four friends who are friends in the beginning and they are friends in the end and they believe that they will be friends forever they probably know in the back of their head that that might not be the case um but it, you know I, I i really wanted to experience it through that lens and it's and it's about change, you know, whatever that means for them, whether it's the future, which can be feel terrifying because they, they don't have control or agency over it, whether it's because they're going to different schools, whether it's because things like marriages end, which is the case with one of the characters, and they don't always have the satisfactory answers to it. Um, I think death, um, you know, I mean, there could be a lot of different types of deaths that we can have, a death of childhood, a death of friendship, a death of innocence, and sometimes, and, you know, again, for a lot of 11 and 12 year olds, the fear of losing your best friends might be the greatest fear you have, maybe more than death, until you encounter death. <laughs> um, and, and, and those things sort of can collide and, and sort of alter your worldview. Most certainly, uh, because, uh, because that symbolism of, of that tree is certainly a huge part of, of the movie. Well, one, one, one more thing, James, is... Uh, could you tell us about the, the casting of, of, of the children? Was, was that a difficult casting process? Because for, for yourself, it doesn't seem like you, you're afraid of directing children. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to, um, you know, I work um, generally with a really great casting director named A.V. Kaufman, um, who, you know, she's cast um, films from film, so many filmmakers that I love, Ang Lee or Jim Sheridan or Steven Spielberg. I, I think I first became aware of her just um, aptitude in casting younger actors um, in, a, in a Jim Sheridan movie from a number of years ago called In America, where there were two sisters that were just remarkable. They were real sisters. But, um, you know, I mean, first and foremost, I wanted to find actors um, to play those roles who I found fascinating, you know, who I found fascinating, who I thought who which of these kids that we meet and it was all like it was zoom because it was making the movie during covid but who will grow up to be the most interesting adults who's imagine i think with an actor of any age their greatest tool is their imagination um so who when we're just talking or improvising who is the most compelling who serves the role but then makes it their own and then as those sort of actors emerged it was figuring out who would work well with each other and who believably would be a friend group you know a friend group that feels believable um to an audience and that and that reflects you know maybe what i knew of a friend group um at that at that age and who will just bounce off each other and bring the, the best out of each other and challenge each other the most that is, that is wonderful because whatever you did 
you got a nice uh, working chemistry with a group of girls and that's that's what you actually accomplished. Oh, thank you. Well, James, hey, congratulations once again for summering and congratulations for uh, making it to Sundance. You know what? I can't wait to uh, to see what imaginative uh, project that you come up with next. <laughs> thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for checking it out. I'm really grateful for the time. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Appreciate it. Next time. All right. Take care. Bye.